Decision theory includes mathematical techniques that can help you decide among alternatives whose results will be seen in the future. If the sequence of events from now to the future is certain, the decision is straightforward. You choose the alternative whose future outcome you prefer. But if there is an intervening event that is uncertain or risky, you cannot be sure which alternative is preferred. Here is an example. You are trying to decide between putting your money in a savings account or investing it in a growth fund. At the end of a year, the savings account will have $100. The growth fund may go up or down over the year as market conditions change. If the market goes up, the growth fund would have $150. If the market goes down, the growth fund would have only $50 at the end of a year. The growth fund is uncertain. This example can be presented as a decision table or as a decision tree. With the growth fund uncertain, there is not an obvious best choice. Partly it depends on the decision maker. A conservative decision maker might worry about the worst case scenarios. A risk taker might focus on the best case scenarios. Between these two extremes are several ways to weight the various outcomes of each alternative. One is to assume the uncertain events have equal likelihood. Let's consider each of these decision theory techniques in turn. A conservative decision maker looks at each decision alternative and focuses on the worst case outcome. For the growth fund, the worst outcome is $50. For the savings account, the worst outcome is $100. Comparing the worst case outcomes, the conservative decision maker chooses the best of them. For our example, the savings account is the choice with the best of the worst payoffs. You may think of this choice as the least bad alternative or best of the worst decision criterion, known as maxi-min for profit examples. Next, consider a risk taker instead. A risk taking decision maker looks at each decision alternative and focuses on the best case outcome. For the growth fund, the best outcome is $150. For the savings account, the best outcome is $100. Comparing the best case outcomes, the risk taking decision maker chooses the best of these. For our example, the growth fund is the choice with the best of the best payoff, or maxi-max for profit examples. Now let's consider a criterion between the extremes of looking at only the worst or only the best payoffs. One approach to attempting to balance uncertain events is to assume that the events are equally likely to occur. This assumption of equal probabilities is an easy, though not necessarily realistic way of handling uncertainty. For our example, there are two possible states for the chance event. The market may go up or the market may go down. So equal probabilities would be 50% each. A simple average uses equal probabilities. For our example, the growth fund payoff will be 150 if the market goes up or 50 if the market goes down. Averaging the outcomes is 150 plus 50 divided by 2 or 50% times 150 plus 50% times 50, yielding an expected payoff of 100. The decision maker then compares average payoffs to choose the best alternative, having assumed equal probabilities for the uncertain market conditions. For our example, both expected averages are the same, so our decision maker would be indifferent between the growth fund and savings account using the equal likelihood criterion. Note that we made an assumption of equal probabilities for market conditions arbitrarily without considering the market's history. If we learn something about the market's history and measure the probabilities of the market going up or down, the situation is labeled risky, whereas the previous situation with unknown probabilities was labeled uncertain. For the risky situation, with known probabilities for the chance events, Weighted average payoffs can be computed for each decision alternative, where the probabilities are the weights. 
These weighted averages are called expected values. Since the market will be going either up or down, the probabilities, here 80% and 20%, must add up to 100%. In our example, for the growth fund, the weights are the probabilities of 80% and 20%. The payoffs are $150 and $50. So the weighted average is 80% times $150 plus 20% times $50, giving an expected value of $130. Comparing the expected values for each alternative, our decision maker chooses the best. For our example, the growth fund has the best expected value, given 80% up, 20% down probabilities. A risk neutral decision maker chooses the alternative whose expected value is best, based on the known probabilities. Expected value is a computation used as a decision-making tool. The future payoff for the growth fund will actually be $150 or $50. For any of the decision theory techniques, the future is unknown at the time the decision has to be made. Computations for decision criteria are helpful tools, but don't guarantee future outcomes. Let's revisit the risky situation in decision tree format. A decision tree is drawn left to right, with time moving from the present to the future. Each branch on the tree represents a decision alternative or a risky event. For decision alternatives, the branches emanate from a square node. For risky or chance events, the branches emanate from a circle, labeled with probabilities measuring the chance of occurrence. For a given circle, the sum of probabilities is 100%, since one of the events in that set is sure to happen. For our example, first, the decision maker chooses where to invest, either growth fund or savings account. Then comes the chance that the market will go up or down, with a probability of 80% that the market will go up and 20% chance that the market will go down. After that, our decision maker will see a payoff of either $150 or $50 from the growth fund or $100 from the savings account. The decision tree is now completely set up with squares representing decisions and circles representing chance events. Branches are labeled, probabilities for chance events, and payoffs where they occur. Here, they are at the future end of the tree. To solve a decision tree, we work from right to left, from the future back to the present. Wherever there is a square, a decision, choose the best, best following branch, because here the decision maker has control over the outcome. Wherever there is a circle, compute expected value, because these events are risky, subject to chance. These are the branches with probabilities. For our example tree, solving from right to left, we first solve the chance of the market going up or down. Since it is a chance event represented by a circle, we compute expected value for the growth fund. It is expected to be $130, equal to 80% times 150 plus 20% times 50, as we have seen before. Moving farther back to the left, we see the decision between the growth fund and the savings account. Since it is a decision represented by a square, we choose the best. That is the expected $130 from the growth fund. So the decision choice would be the growth fund. Now the tree is completely solved. The best risk neutral decision would be to invest in the growth fund and take a chance on whether it will pay off $150 or $50. Now let's take a closer look at the future chance event and the value of information about it. Because it is in the future, we had to decide where to invest before seeing whether the market went up or down. 
Suppose we could get information that would be like an early warning of whether the market will be going up or down. Such information might come from a forecast or market research, or even from being an insider to the financial market in question. If having such advanced information improves the expected value of the decision, then the information is valuable. The value of the information is equal to the difference between the value with that information and the best you can do without it. Consider the case where the information is a perfect predictor. That will give an upper limit on the value of advanced information. In our example, if we had perfect information in advance about whether the market will be going up or down, 80% of the time it will be predicting ups, and 20% of the time it would be predicting downs. Faced with the decision of what to do, knowing that the market will be going up, we would prefer the growth fund. Faced with the decision of what to do, knowing that the market will be going down, we would prefer the savings account. So 80% of the time, we will expect the market to go up, invest in the growth fund, and payoff will be $150. And 20% of the time, we will expect the market to go down, invest in the savings account, and payoff will be $100. Thus, with perfect information, our expected value will be 80% times $150 plus 20% times $100 equal to $140. Expected value with perfect information. Recall that without information, our best choice was the growth fund whose expected value was $130. Having perfect information in advance raises the value of the investment decision by $10. To summarize, the expected value of perfect information is the difference between the expected value with that information and the best expected value without. In this example, 140 minus 130, or $10. The complete example is shown here.